Hello and welcome to the New Testament Daily with me, Jerry Dierman, where we read and talk through a chapter of the New Testament every single day. I'm glad you're here because reading God's Word daily will change your life. You can also help others find out about this resource and stay in the Word daily when you click like on this video, subscribe to my YouTube channel, or share this link with others. So let's pray and then we'll jump into God's Word. Father, thank you so much for the precious, written, inspired, living Word of God. And I pray that by the Holy Spirit, each of us would hear exactly what you want to say to us. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, here we go. Romans chapter 13. Let every soul, that's every person, let every soul be subject to the governing authorities. For there is no authority except from God, and the authorities that exist are appointed by God. Let me just stop and say that God is in favor of structure. God is in favor of authority. God is in favor of uh, laws and law enforcement and such. But don't take this to mean that every person that is ever elected or appointed to any position, that that was God's favorite person and best choice to put there. That is not the case. But it's, it's saying that God is the one who established structure and authority and such. And so we have to know that if we buck the authority, we're bucking a system, a process, leadership that God has designed and helped us as human beings to put in place to protect us from ourselves, to protect us from uh, from the flesh, from the carnality, from the selfishness, from the hate and such. And so he's saying, let every soul be subject to the governing authorities, governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God, and the authorities that exist are appointed by God. Therefore, whoever resists the authority resists the ordinance of God. In other words, the ways of God, the, the laws of God, the way that God set things up. God set things up so that the populace, the population of people would, would follow their authorities. Now, of course, not talking about authority that is telling you to reject the Lord Jesus Christ, to reject God's ways and such. Well, of course, that's when civil disobedience is appropriate. It's when they're calling for us to do wrong toward God and wrong toward each other. That's different. Okay, so therefore, whoever resists the authority resists the ordinance of God, and those who resist will bring judgment on themselves. You break the laws, you'll bring judgment on yourself. Verse 3, for rulers are not a terror to good works, but to evil. Do you want to be unafraid of the authority? Do what is good, and you will have praise from the same. So he's just talking generally. He's not talking about any specific government, any specific nation, any spe specific elected officials and such. He's just talking in generalities about authorities and structures and such. And he's saying rulers are not a terror to good works, generally speaking. In other words, the people that break the law are the ones that they're going to be a terror to. They're going to cause problems for people who break the law. And so he goes on to say, do you want to be unafraid of the authority? Do what is good and you will have praise from the same. So don't break the law and then you won't have the problems with the authority. That This is what he's saying. So uh, an old TV show used to say something like, uh, don't do the crime unless you want to do the time or something to that effect, right? And uh, this is what Paul's saying here. Verse 4. For he, talking about the authority, the law enforcement, so to speak, he is God's minister to you for good. So notice, no matter, you know, Paul's writing here to the Romans. This is under the Roman Empire, certainly not a godly uh, uh, Christian, Judeo-Christian system. Mm -mm, they are a pagan system. Okay, and so... But he's still talking generally that these soldiers, these officers, these governors, proconsuls and such, they have authority. And it says, for he is God's minister to you for good. God sets up systems and God has established authorities for the general good of the people. So he's talking in a general way. He goes on to say, but if you do evil, be afraid. 
for he does not spare the sword in vain. Talking about these authorities, they have authority for a reason. They can throw you in jail or whatever. They don't bear the sword in vain. For he is God's minister and avenger to execute wrath on him who practices evil. In other words, God set up government and authority and law enforcement and such because evil people would never stop doing evil. They would do more and more evil to people if somebody didn't force them to change, if somebody didn't either punish them to the degree that they changed their behavior or locked them up so they didn't have the freedom to do it anymore. Evil will not stop being evil by conversations. And so this is what the Bible is talking about, that God is in favor of and God is on the side of uh, of laws and law enforcement. Uh, therefore, you must be subject not only because of wrath, in other words, of the potential punishment that would come if you committed a crime, but also for conscience sake. What does that mean for conscience sake? Like, well, if, if you're doing a crime, but you didn't get caught and you say, okay, see, I found a way not to get caught doing crimes. And he's saying, no, you need to not only not do wrong because of the consequences of getting caught, but you shouldn't do wrong because of your own conscience, that it's wrong. Verse six, for because of this, you also pay taxes. In other words, because of this process, this need to have authorities who enforce the laws, because of this, you pay taxes. Well, who? how are these people going to survive? How are they going to live unless there are taxes that are exacted from the people? For, for because of this, you also pay taxes. So here's the Bible recognizing that taxation, normal taxation, to be able to compensate for these necessary authorities and programs in a nation, that this is accepted by God. This is the an appropriate appropriate process and even one that God in his wisdom implements. So for because of this, you also pay taxes for they are God's ministers attending continually to this very thing. Render therefore to all their due. In other words, whatever you're supposed to pay and do, do it. Render therefore to all their due. Taxes to whom taxes are due. Customs to whom customs fear, or we might call that respect, fear to whom fear, honor to whom honor. In other words, make sure that you as a believer are doing your part. Don't, don't listen to other people that say, I ain't doing this and that. And no, he's saying that that's not the way we should live. We should live in concert with, in agreement with, in unity with the government that's trying to keep order and trying to give, keep peace. Now, let me just push pause right there. Because there are, and we've seen this in our nation, there are some people that are within the governmental structure and law enforcement and such that their heart is not right and they use that authority to treat people wrongly. And, well, that's wrong. And we ought to call for that to be punished and for that to be weeded out so that we don't have racism, we don't have people in political structures that are, I have ideologies that would punish the other side or not give them a fair chance. Well, no, that's, that's not right. See, so we should be voting in favor of equality. We should be voting in favor of everybody having their freedoms, the laws being enforced in an equitable way and such. Absolutely. But sometimes you start to try to stand for justice or equality, but what comes along with that is inequality toward other people and injustice in other ways. And so sometimes weeding through the complexity of who's right and who's wrong is difficult. But generally speaking, the Bible's just speaking in generalities, not about any particular nation or government or people, and just saying generally speaking, Christians ought to be paying the taxes that they're supposed to be paying, obeying the laws that they're supposed to be obeying, uh, with or without consequences. And then he says in verse 8, Owe no one anything except to love one another. Well, he just got finished saying, pay taxes where you're supposed to take, pay taxes, customs to whom you're supposed to pay customs, and be respectful, be honoring, 
owe no one anything except to love one another. In other words, don't, don't not pay these things and you owe them, but owe no one anything except to love one another for he who loves another has fulfilled the law. What does that mean? Do you remember Jesus said all of the law, hang on two commandments, love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. So here he's saying, owe no one anything except to love one another, for he who loves another has fulfilled the law. For the commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness, you shall not covet. And if there is any other commandment, all are summed up in this saying, Namely, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. He goes on to say, love does no harm to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. If you're loving somebody, you're not going to covet their property. You're not going to commit adultery with them and, or their spouse. You're not going to steal from them. You're not going to murder them. See, so all these laws, if you just love them, you won't be violating these laws against other people. Verse 11, and do this knowing the time. In other words, you need to pay attention to the fact that we're not going to be on this earth forever. There is an end of the age. There is a judgment that's coming. And do this knowing the time that now it is high time to awake out of sleep. For now our salvation is nearer than we first believed. Well, that I guess is always the case, right? It's always nearer than when we first believed. But he He's saying way back 2,000 years ago, he's saying, man, it, we have to live as if it's imminent, as if it's right here upon us. Well, if that was the way they should live 2,000 years ago, just think how much more today we need to live this way. Verse 12, the night is far spent, the day is at hand. Therefore, let us cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of light. Let us also, excuse me, let us walk properly as in the day, not in revelry and drunkenness, not, not being partiers and just living, you know, Friday to Friday, so to speak, weekend to weekend, not in lewdness and lust, not letting your flesh get out of hand and not be obedient to the word of God, not in strife and envy, arguing with people, attitudes, anger, or envy. I always want what somebody else has. But watch this the last verse in the chapter, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to fulfill its lust, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, let me explain this way. When you get born again, Jesus is inside of you. But he's saying, don't just let Jesus be tucked away inside your spirit. Put on the Lord Jesus Christ. Let him get here on the outside to where the way you live, the way you talk, the way you behave, the way you conduct yourself, carry yourself, is the way that the Lord Jesus lives and talks and carries himself. But put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to fulfill its lust. Don't make room for the flesh to do what it wants to do. The flesh is always going to want to do something that's disobedient to God. It's just about me making me feel good, making me uh, more comfortable. I, I want it, so... I want it. No, put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to fulfill its lust. What a great little chapter there, an important chapter, especially for the days in which we live. I'll see you tomorrow for chapter 14.